Hi, today you're going to be getting college advice from the Walmart version of Ms. Frizzle. Nice to meet you. Okay, but actually, I just finished my first year at UCLA and I am here to answer all of your questions. College classes are harder than high school, but they're not that much harder. My high school teachers kind of scared me, honestly. They were like, college is gonna be so hard. We wanna prepare you as best you can, but they're not gonna be as lenient as us. But it wasn't that much harder. I don't study super hard majors. Like I'm not a pre-med student or anything. I do the social sciences and humanities in communications and linguistics. I also took hard classes at a good public high school where my teachers adequately prepared me for college. So my perceived gap between high school and college might be very different from yours, but I don't think you should be scared. The main difference is there's a higher reading workload. Again, especially because I'm in the social sciences and humanities. You're expected to read several journal articles or an entire book even in a week. And at least once you get out of the intro classes, there is a lot less memorization involved and a lot more application or writing. There's a higher expectation that you know how to analyze and think critically and apply your ideas and express your ideas effectively, all that stuff. Overall, I'd say AP classes are the closest comparison, especially those higher level, harder APs. And if you got mostly fives on your AP tests, you should be decently prepared to get mostly A's and B's in college. And I got pretty much all fives on my AP tests, which directly translate to getting almost all A's, even at a supposedly like harder school. And speaking of like harder schools, I want to let you know that no matter what school you're going to, you are completely qualified to succeed there. Colleges don't really accept people that they think will completely collapse and not be able to handle the academics. So no matter where you're going, whether it be community college or the most elite of universities, know that you are there because you are qualified to be there. If you feel like you're not qualified, you're probably suffering from something called imposter syndrome, which is your brain telling you that you didn't deserve anything you've done. Everything was just a fluke. You're just lucky. You didn't work hard enough. You aren't actually smart enough. None of that is true. I promise you. It's just imposter syndrome. Don't listen to that part of your brain. Do not buy textbooks before the class starts. And especially, do not buy them from your campus bookstore. There are a couple reasons for this advice. First, campus bookstores are notoriously overpriced and you can usually find better deals on used or rental or even brand new textbooks elsewhere. Secondly, I wouldn't buy things before the class starts because maybe you don't need it. I've experienced this in one of my history classes. The syllabus had this massive list of like four books to buy, but you didn't have to read all of them. You just had to read enough to know enough to write the papers. And lastly, there are a lot of ways you can get free PDF versions off the internet. When it does come to used or online PDF textbooks, you do wanna check with the professor and ask whether an older version would be acceptable, but usually it'll end up okay. You just want to wait until you absolutely have to buy it. That way you can avoid spending hundreds on something you might not actually end up needing. By the way, smooth segue into a quick ad break. Cause you know, I can't give you college advice if I don't pay for my tuition. Thank you to BetterHelp for sponsoring this video. Your first year of college can be a rough time, you know, loneliness and sadness from missing home, or anxiety and social issues around meeting new people and going through so many new things. If anything like this is interfering with your goals, BetterHelp can assess your needs and connect you to a licensed professional therapist and help you to start chatting within 48 hours. This is not a crisis line. It's not a formulaic self-help course. You will be connected to professional counselors just securely through the internet. Speaking of the counselors, they have a network of over 15,000 of them. The service is available worldwide and you can log into your account and send a secure message to your counselor at any time. Additionally, it's really important to better help that you feel like your therapist is a great fit for you. So it's free and very convenient to switch around and find a better match if needed. And on the convenience side, it's more affordable than traditional offline counseling and there is financial aid available. So if this sounds interesting to you, visit betterhelp.com slash studyquill. That's better H-E-L-P dot com slash studyquill. And I'm guessing many of y'all are about to be financially strapped college students. So BetterHelp has a special offer of 10% off for studyquill viewers. Again, visit betterhelp.com slash studyquill to check it out. Thanks again for sponsoring this video. And now back to the advice stuff. Please, for the love of God, 
go to office hours. The thing about college for most people is that everything you learn in college could technically be learned for free online through the library with books and online courses and everything like that. So the value of going to a university is not just to obtain knowledge, it's to you know get a certification, but it's also to network with people. And some of the best people you can network with are your professors. If you're in a professional field like film or marketing, a lot of your professors will just be people with significant experience in the industry and they may be able to connect you with others who can get you internships or just get your name out there to increase your possibilities of getting better jobs in the future. And even if that's not relevant to you, like I don't think I am going to network within the linguistics industry, you can still gain a lot from asking them for help with your homework or asking them their thoughts on something from the course reading or just gleaning a little bit of information from their wealth of knowledge since, you know, they are leading experts in their subject field. And helping to form a relationship with them usually means that they might be a little nicer to you if you mess up in the class. Like I accidentally submitted a wrong document for my communications final and I don't know if the TA would have been as lenient if I hadn't gone to their office hours so often. And a word of advice, which maybe is not what you need to hear after just getting out of high school and grinding super hard to get that solid 95% for that 4.0. You don't need all A's. Okay, but the exception is if you know you're going to grad school, then it does become more important that you have as high of a GPA as possible. Although somewhere around the like 3738 range is where most people say like that's close enough to a 4.0 that it doesn't matter that much. But yeah, everyone else who just plans to max out at a bachelor's degree, like most employers don't care that much about your GPA unless you're straight up failing school. In fact, especially if you're doing a pre-professional major like business or whatever, you would probably benefit more from going out and networking and forming connections and doing work experience, internships, like the return on investment of spending four hours every day at an internship is a lot higher than spending four hours every day studying to get that 0 0.002 extra points on your GPA. I don't mean that you need to just like go out and start failing all your classes. Like do get to know your industry and see how much grades matter and what their like baseline standards are, but don't stress out too much. C's get degrees, A's are good, but you don't have to have them. Always read professor reviews. You can find these reviews on sites like Rate My Professor, I think is the most common one. For my UCLA students out there, we have our own special website called a Bruin Walk, which also displays grade distributions along with the professor reviews. A good professor can really make or break your experience. Like if grades are important to you because you're going to med school, not all intro chem professors are created equal. Some will force the class to be on a curve and some will just give A's to people who deserve it. And no matter how much you think a subject will be interesting, a boring professor can truly ruin it. Reading the reviews will not only give you a good idea of what classes to take, which ones to avoid, they can also give you a lot of advice about how to succeed in the class. A lot of people will post information about grading structures or tips on how to succeed on projects, and sometimes people will post their contact information because they're reselling the textbooks for cheap, so keep an eye out for that too. Assuming your school has general education requirements, which are just like general things you have to learn that are outside of your major. If you are 100% sure of your major, finish your major as fast as possible before you start to chip away at your GEs. If you aren't so sure, do your GEs first and then pick your major and do it. Let me explain my reasoning for both sides of this. If you're 100% sure of your major, you just wanna knock that out out of the way so you know you'll be done with it and able to graduate with that degree within four years. And it's advantageous to save the GEs for later because there are usually like a hierarchy of the more desirable, interesting GEs with good professors or easy grading structures. And those are harder to enroll into. So it helps to finish your major early, usually because not as many people are competing to get into those major only classes then you can move on to your GE requirements with your newly advanced senior standing to get the best possible GEs. But if you, like the average undergraduate, have not 100% settled on a major yet and you wanna explore your options a little more, I would start with GEs first. This is kind of what I did because within each GE requirement, like historical knowledge, social knowledge, quantitative reasoning, there's usually at least one class that you can use to explore your interests and help you 
determine what your major might be. For example, I took Intro to Communication Studies as my Social Analysis GE, and then I decided that I liked it so much I would be a Communications major. So if you're like freshman me and still exploring your options, Picking classes that are both interesting as a potential major and fulfill a GE requirement is a great way to knock out two birds with one stone. See an academic advisor as soon as you can. Course catalogs and major requirements and all these complicated, weird looking websites can be really hard to navigate. And your advisors, especially your advisor for your major, will know a lot about what you'll need to get done. You don't even necessarily need to go out of your way for this. A lot of times they'll have advising appointments at freshman orientation. This is just so essential to do before you even get started on course planning for your first semester, especially if you are a STEM major, engineering, like doing the pre-med courses. These majors, these highly technical majors, tend to have very specific prerequisites that you must take in a certain sequence because this next class requires this previous class and that one requires this and that requires that and it's all very complicated to work out and you must get started on planning early or else you'll miss a step and have to graduate a semester late or something like that. So go ask, ask them to help you set up a four-year plan for your major, your minor, studying abroad, pre-med, whatever other things you want to add into the mix there. Because what is life without a plan? You have like eight semesters at college or 12 quarters, assuming you're not at summer student. You gotta get on it. Making friends will take a lot of effort, a lot more effort than it took in high school. If you had that traditional high school experience where you stayed put for pretty much your entire childhood, like these people knew you your entire life. Even those who you didn't really talk to until later in high school, they have been like subconsciously aware of you almost their entire life. And even the largest high schools tend to be smaller than the small end of colleges. So it's a lot easier for you to simply run into the same people many, many times over and over because you have the same classes or you just pass each other in the halls. And unfortunately, this likely will not be the case at college and university. And at the average larger public school, you will never see anybody twice unless you make a conscious effort to see them again. And that's what I mean by it takes effort to make friends. Not that people are inherently more closed off, but that you will have to put deliberate planning into seeing somebody multiple times to get to know them and to bond with them. It's especially hard during online school too, because like you don't really have those chance meetings or just striking up a random conversation while you're waiting in a lunch line. You have to be incredibly deliberate in making contacts and staying in touch with them. Other people will most likely be making these efforts too, but having you just lie back and sit there, like waiting for somebody to make contact with you, significantly reduces your chances of like actually making friends. So I would recommend that you be the proactive one as well and you go out there and talk to people. And you might be asking, like, how the heck do I do that? Just walk up to random people and ambush them on the street? Now, if you are confident enough to be talking to strangers and doing it safely, good for you. I'm not like that. I'm sure most of my viewers are not like that. So what I recommend you do is to join clubs and organizations. I think this is the best way to like regularly see the same people over and over again, which is like the natural way. I think humans start to bond with each other and it's a natural springboard for bonding because you already know you have a shared interest. You're joining the hockey team because you both play hockey or you're joining the Harry Potter club because you all like Harry Potter. So you've already got things in common and things to talk about. The club organization structure does the hard part of bringing people together and giving them a reason to be there. All you have to do is actually attend and talk to people while you're there. This part probably goes without saying, but just in case, you don't need to do anything you don't want to do. Whether it be partying or substance use or like hookups, dating, even just like going hiking when you're exhausted and you don't want to go hiking. You don't have to do it. Just say no. No is a complete sentence. I don't want to is a complete sentence. And if somebody is pressuring you into something you already said you didn't want to do, that is somebody who is so comfortable disrespecting other people's boundaries that I would honestly say you probably don't want to hang around with them again until they change their ways. This advice is more for my fellow nerdy people who are far too good at delaying gratification, and that is don't be ashamed to have fun. I think it goes without saying that I don't support irresponsible partying or drinking, but there is also nothing wrong with wanting to have fun because the purpose of life is not to suffer. <laughs> the purpose of life is to sometimes do unpleasant things so that you can ultimately have positive experiences in the long term. 
one of my flaws and the flaws of many people who are very academically oriented is that we focus so much on setting ourselves up for the future, working hard so that our future self may enjoy something, that we keep putting off the fun for later, 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 and never allow ourselves to enjoy the present. So of course, making sure that you are safe and responsible, I say, let yourself have fun. Let yourself let loose and actually enjoy life. Sorry, I'm trying to like toe that line and not jump into like my philosophies on the purpose of life, but let's get into something a little bit more practical. I recommend you research and start getting involved in your school's major traditions. For example, at UCLA, you might have seen that one viral video on TikTok of the midnight scream. And this is when during all of finals week at midnight, People in the Westwood apartments and dorm housing will just scream out of their windows to release negative energy. Every school has something unique and I recommend you get involved in those because they're a lot of fun and not really something you can find much of anywhere else. Like when else in my adult life will it be socially acceptable for me to scream out of my window at midnight? Probably none, no other times. I don't have a lot of great advice on communal bathroom living just because during my time in the dorm, I lived in a single with a private bathroom due to COVID safety precautions. But next year I will be having a shared bathroom. So I will get back to you with my advice on that at a later date perhaps. But I have lived in communal bathroom dorms for many, many weeks during summer camp experiences. And the one thing I wish I had was a bathrobe. Like, you know how when you get out of the shower and you're just like a little bit damp and a little bit sticky because like your towel can't fully dry all the moisture off you and it's a struggle to like pull on your jeans and put everything on because of the extra friction. Now imagine doing that in a communal dorm bathroom. You can hear someone peeing on your left. All the showers are on. It's incredibly wet. There's a puddle on the ground in the shower that you're standing in. Not sure where it's from. Hopefully it's water. And there's a line forming around the block because so many people want to take a shower after you. What do you do now? It's so incredibly stressful to like get dressed in this kind of environment. So bathrobe, perfect solution. A lot of people ask me questions about how to pack for your dorm. And I would say my number one tip is to just bring what you already use every day. There are a lot of dorm packing videos out there. I made one myself about essentials to bring, waste of space, don't bring it. But ultimately it just depends a lot on what you personally will need because we, surprise, surprise, all have different personal lifestyles. For example, in my video, I said that a blender is not necessary for me. It's simply an accessory to this aspirational lifestyle where I drink smoothies every morning, but I don't actually use a smoothie in my daily life at home. But maybe you already use it daily. Maybe you are that girl who makes acai bowls and like green juice every single day. If you do, bring it. The only thing I would avoid bringing for now is stuff that you know will be free or very cheaply accessible through university resources. For me, this is something like a printer. It takes up a lot of space, but it's already so cheap for me to print at the university's public access printers that it doesn't feel like it's worth the space and the money for me to buy and bring my own printer. Bring a couple of sentimental items that remind you of home. My first few weeks of college were really rough for homesickness. It might not be so hard for you, especially if you have more of the traditional first year of college experience where you're like actually going out and having fun as opposed to me being stuck in my room by myself all day. But yeah, I was really homesick and having familiar objects around me, just like the familiar patterns on my plates or having the bedspread that I had used for four years before just felt so comforting. It was like being surrounded by friends. They're not friends, they're not alive. I don't live in like that Beauty and the Beast castle, but you get what I'm saying? This is not really an instruction, but I just want you to know about the sunk cost fallacy. This is the fallacy in thinking of like, oh, I've already invested so much time or effort into this. I might as well finish it, right? Of course, there is something to be said for persistence. Like when the going gets hard, you do maybe want to push yourself to finish and follow through with a goal you've wanted to complete. But there is a point where like, you don't wanna keep dragging yourself through this suffering process in order to get a result that you don't actually even want. I feel like this usually comes up with stuff like majors and classes and other long-term commitments. If you don't like a class and it sucks, just switch to another class. Or if you really need this other major or program in order to align with your career goals and you're already halfway through a different one that's ill-suited to your goals, don't force yourself to finish that degree just because, oh, I'm already halfway done with it. The next semester or year or two years will pass by no matter what. So at a certain point, it is better to be halfway done with something that you actually do want 
than completely done with something you literally do not want and have no use for. Learn about personal finance, please. I want this generation, especially my 80 to 90% female viewers, hello, I want us to be the most financially literate generation of young adults to ever exist. There's a lot to learn and I can't really tell you everything about this in just this one segment of this video. So check out my video that I made a year ago about personal finance for students. The reason this is so important for you to know right as soon as you turn 18 and are getting ready to go into the adult world is that a lot of aspects of personal finance require time to be on your side or at least having more time on your side getting started earlier is a huge advantage like retirement savings compound interest compounds over time and an extra 10 years in the market will nearly double your savings and if i'm saying a lot of words that make no sense to you check out my video about personal finance i'll tell you about everything please go watch it enough self promo let's move on to the next tip time management in college is a lot more like planning your summer breaks than it is planning your life during a high school school year your time in college is a lot less structured just like when you're on break from school yeah you'll have classes but if you take the typical course load you'll have maybe 15 hours spent in class each week compared to high school which has such a rigid schedule of you show up at eight you leave at three and everything in between is already planned and scheduled for you it's so freeform. Being kind of able to do things whenever you want, wherever you want, make things easier, but also harder. You can take a lot more breaks and have a lot more fun, but you also do have to be a lot more self-directed about like getting yourself to class, getting yourself to study, getting yourself to eat lunch. If you feel like you struggle to keep yourself on track during a summer break when you want to be doing something and you have very few actual time commitments, it's something to maybe work on right now during the summer. What I like to do is just put all my time commitments and tasks in Google Calendar and some of my more long-term organization stuff in the Notion app. But again, try things out, figure out what works best for you. I'll also be making a time management guide video later this summer, so wait for that if you would like to, although I think you should just get started now and then watch my video later. And last but not least, a piece of advice that's a little more specific to this weird COVID year. If you don't know where you're going, use Google Maps because chances are anybody you ask for directions will also have no idea where they're going. For the 2021 to 2022 school year, the seniors are the only ones who will have spent an entire full school year taking classes on campus. The juniors will know a little bit about the campus and the sophomores, freshmen, and transfers will have no idea where anything is. So population wise, statistically, if you ask a random person, they are most likely in the majority of the school that has no idea where anything is. Google Maps will help, I promise. So the thing I recommend is on Google Maps, you can actually have it like speak directions out loud to you. So just put your phone in your pocket, put your headphones in, start walking. It'll tell you where to go. Anyways, that's everything for today's video and I hope you found it helpful. I upload new videos about student life every week and you can visit my Instagram, my TikTok, and my second channel for some sporadic content. See you next time.